We can rise to the occasion. We can build this nation moving forward. All that we need, visionary leadership, people who love their people, people who love the citizens, people who love the country, and that we can rise. We can fly again. I am not going to give up and die, but I shall live. You shall live. Hope Restoration Ministries, restoring hope to our world. Welcome to our broadcast. Enjoy. Amen. I'm so honored to be here with you today. Well, I want to speak to you on something that I think all of us at different times in our lives may be walking through. And how many has ever been in a drought before? <laughs> now, you may have been in a drought in the city, and where I'm from in California, we experience droughts. And I know in Africa we experience droughts, right? Uh, but sometimes we go through spiritual droughts. Sometimes we go through droughts in our finances. Sometimes we go through droughts in our relationships. Sometimes we go through a sickness drought where we have been going through it for so long and we don't know when it's going to end. And we're so thirsty. <laughs> We're ready for it to end. Some droughts last a year, some six months, some have lasted 10 years. And I don't know what you're going through today, but I want to speak to you today on coming out of the drought and into the abundance of rain. And we're talking about spring today, right? The beautiful thing about spring is when you get that spring rain. And it begins to water the flowers and it begins to make things beautiful again. And you know, some things in life don't always go as planned, do they? You know, you thought you walked through one door, it seemed like life took the wrong turn. You found yourself in the desert, a drought of epic proportions. Maybe you're in a drought right now. Adversity, it seems like, on every side, and you're trying your best. Maybe years of frustration and pain. And you need a supernatural healing to take place in your life. Well, I love this scripture in Psalm. If you want to turn your Bible, Psalm chapter 84, verses 5 through 7. I love this scripture here. Because it talks about when you're going through the desert. When you're going through that desert period in your life. What you need to do. And it says in verse 5, Blessed is the man whose strength is in you. See, I want to encourage you today. You're not in the desert to die. You are in the desert so God can show you a new way to live. He's getting you ready for something bigger. You just don't know it. And many times we want to give up when we're in the desert. But we don't realize that that process of what God is taking us through is getting ready not just for your life, but your testimony and how it's going to touch others. I love it. As it goes on, it says, whose heart is set on a pilgrimage. You know, pilgrimage many times is a journey. And some droughts are short. Some droughts can be longer. But here's the key whenever you're going through a drought. Don't give up. Keep going. Keep taking another step. Don't give up. Because somewhere along the line, God is going to meet you. And you know what? Many times we give up before we get the victory. And you, here's the thing you've got to understand. You... you you don't have grace for two weeks from now. You don't have grace for two years from now. You only have grace for today. See, God didn't give the children of Israel manna for two weeks from now or two years from now. He gave them manna for that day. Why? Because he wants us to let go of our self-effort and give ourselves completely to him so he can do his master work. And when I look at Going through a drought, man, when, when I'm looking at the future, it looks overwhelming, doesn't it? Because it seems impossible. And then if you carry things from the past, well, that's going to pull you back. But I can handle today. <laughs> I got grace for a day. So God, I'm going to make this the best day I can. Amen? I can handle that. It goes on to say, as they pass through the Valley of Baca, now, the Valley of Baca this scripture speaks of was part of the desert country. It was filled with thorns, wild animals, vipers, and all sorts of danger. 
What was interesting, it was nearly impossible to travel through the valley without it, them suffering some type of extreme hardship. And you're, you know, you may be in that hardship right now, but here, here's something very interesting about this. Yet this valley was the only passageway into the high hills where Israel's city of refuge was located. And some scholars state the Valley of Baca was also representative of the valley that led to the city of Jerusalem and the temple of God. Now here's why this is important. You have to sometimes go through the desert to get to the rooftop. <laughs> to get to the high hills. To get to the city of refuge. You sometimes have to go through that. Matter of fact, some of us, it's a lot of times we have to go through that. But don't worry. Your redemption is drawing nigh. It's on its way. Keep going. Don't give up. You're about to get there. If you'll wait, if you won't wait, and you won't give up. Amen? Amen. See, when we're going through a drought, we can either do three things. We can, we can look down. And when we look down, we feel the heaviness of that drought. You know what it's like. When you're feeling that heaviness, you, 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 your child's going through something, you're going through a financial issue. Man, it, it's heavy. But you can't see anything when you look down. When you look straight ahead, that's better. But here's the thing. When you look straight ahead, that's, you can only see so far. It's not until you look up. It's not until you look up. That's where your redemption draws nigh. See, God, he's like a chess master. You ever see a chess master? They know how the game's going to end after a few moves. See, he knows how your story ends. And your story does not end in defeat. Your story ends in victory today. And if you'll keep going, allow God and look up and allow him to make the moves in your life, you will reach your promised land. Amen? Come on, somebody. Scripture goes on. <laughs> See, it says they make it a spring, and the rain also covers it with pools. You know, it's easy to thank God when you're on the mountaintop. But if you can thank God in the desert, if you can give God praise in the desert, if you can say, God, I know I'm in the worst situation I've ever had in my life, but God, I know I'm going to come through this. You know what that's like? What you're doing is you're making a spring even in the desert. You're creating pools of living water that will not just sustain you for them. It, you're going to be able to go back to that pool when you go through another desert. When you go through another challenge in your life. Because here's why. When you do that. And I love this part. They go from strength to strength. Say it with me. They go from strength to strength. You see, here's the deal. Once you've conquered your desert, you won't respond to the next desert the same way. You move from survivor to overcomer. Your test becomes your testimony. You live in the vision and not in the circumstance. So the next time that difficult time comes in your life, you're going to stand strong. You're going to say, I've already been through that. No problem. Let's go, God. What are you going to show me this time? This test is going to be my testimony. I'm going to live in the vision and not the circumstance. I am on my way to my victory. You say, Craig, it's tough to see that. It's tough to see that. You see, I was, I was there. I know what you're talking about. And we went through one of the most difficult deserts in our life. I want to show you my family real quick. Yeah. And uh, that's my son, Corey. And Corey is a children's pastor in Oklahoma. And he's about to get married in a couple months. Amen. I tried to get him a good African woman, but it didn't work out. Would have been so much better. No, I'm just kidding. I'm really, really happy. But uh, uh, we're, we're so proud of him. And that's my daughter, Courtney. And Courtney is 31 years old, and she's a movie producer and director. And so, yes, amen. And God's using her right now. She's in Greece filming a miniseries on the House of David. 
So look for that. It'll be on Prime Video, and, and so look for that coming up. We're so proud of her. That's my son, Connor, and you're going to hear a little bit more about him. And this is my wife, Samantha, and we've been married for 34 years. Yes. And that's by far the longest I've ever went out with a girl, so that's a big deal right there. But I'll never forget, looking back, you know, we had a 10-year-old and 12-year-old. And we thought we were done having kids. So as a man, I got that operation to be done having kids, right? And I got that on a Thursday. <laughs> and my wife came in crying on the following Saturday. And she said, Craig, you won't believe this, but I'm pregnant. And I said, how did that happen? And then I start crying. But after we got through the shock, we were really excited because we were about to have our new baby boy. Our, my, my older kids, they were so excited. And when Connor was born, he was just like our other two kids. He would play with other playmates when they would come over. He would uh, give us a hug and a kiss and show so much emotion. He would say, I love you, Mommy and Daddy, and say so many words, even by the time he was two and a half. But then all, one day, when he was two and a half, in about a two to three week period, all that shifted. Where he would play with other playmates, now he would go sit by himself and stir off at the wall and play by himself. Where he would give us a hug and a kiss, now he showed very little emotion whatsoever and would look away. Where he would say, I love you, mommy and daddy, and say so many words, now he stopped speaking altogether. The only way I could really explain it to you, it was like a, a car wreck. Where one day your child's one way, another day your child's another way. And we didn't really know what to do when this happened. We, we didn't know what it was. We, we didn't know uh, how to respond. But of course, you know, moms are maternal. They get on that computer and they start looking for any type of therapy, any type of help that they possibly can. And we soon I'll never forget this. We, we were, I was driving home from work at Lakewood, and I got a call, and my wife said, Craig, she said, uh, uh, we just got a call from Texas Children's Hospital, and, and Connor's on the middle of the spectrum with autism, and he's going to need a lot of help. And she said, we, we both cried together. I remember during that time right there, I've never felt the desert like there. <laughs> It was probably one of my lowest times, and I remember the enemy coming in. And then he started speaking to me in one ear as I was driving home. He said, Craig, your child's not going to be like your other children. Your child will be worthless. The world will look at your child as worthless. He'll never do anything with, with his life. But let me tell you how you come out of the desert, how you come out of the drought and in the abundance of rain. You stop listening to what the enemy says, and you start listening to what God says about your son. And still continue to listen to what the enemy said. I hit the gas in my car. I drove home. I ran upstairs and I picked up my little boy. And I said, you are not a victim. You are a victor. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You are more than a conqueror. See, we have those moments in our life where we've got to decide who we're going to listen to. Are we going to listen to the enemy's report? Or are we going to listen to the report of the Lord? And when Connor stopped speaking, then the desert really got challenging. The drought really got hard. Because when he stopped talking, he knew he could speak at one time, but now he couldn't get the words out. And so he would point to things. And if we didn't understand what, what, what he meant or what he was saying, then, then, then he would have these terrible meltdowns. And they just got worse and worse and worse. And I remember by the time he was five years old, we were trying every type of therapy. We were trying every type of help. We were praying. We, 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 we were trying everything we knew how to do. But we needed a word from the Lord. <laughs> and I remember it got so bad that one night, one day my wife was in the grocery store and she was buying groceries and, and she had Connor with him and Connor won some candy from the shelves. And so, so uh, she was telling him no and putting the candy back off on the shelf and he didn't understand and he probably had the worst meltdown he'd ever had right in the middle of the grocery store. See, the human condition looks at that situation. People were looking at her like, why aren't you disciplining your child better? And it had nothing to do with that. 
She was just trying to make sure that, that Connor didn't hurt himself. And literally, she had, to, she had to put her arms around Connor. And she had to drag him out of the store and all the way through the parking lot and all the way to the car. And I remember her calling me on the phone. And she called me on the phone. And, and I could just hear just the desperation in her voice. And she told me the story. And she said a, a statement that... that that we'll say when we're going through the drought, she said, Craig, I'm not sure if I can do this anymore. And you gotta understand, my wife's my hero. She's one of the strongest people you'll ever meet. I knew she was saying this off of emotion. But for me, man, I was in it. How many's ever been there? <laughs> I was in the drought. My lowest moment, probably my most vulnerable moment. And I remember I was sitting there with God and I had one of the most intimate conversations with God I've ever had. It was like he was sitting in the seat next to me. It was like, it was almost audible. It was like right there. And I, here's what, what happened. I was driving and I just turned to the seat. I just asked God why. Have you ever asked God why? Not why we had our son, but why is he struggling so much? I'll never forget what God spoke to me, and he just said this. He said, Craig, your child is not a burden. Your child is a gift. Now, when you look at that situation from human, human eyes, you go, well, that's a burden. When you look at stigmas around special needs and how people view them, they go, that's a burden. But God was showing me through spiritual eyes. Craig, your child's not a burden. Your child's a gift. I said, God, I know what you mean, but he's struggling so much, and we're trying everything. And he said to me again, Craig, your child's not a burden. Your child's a gift. He said, you're looking at everything that's wrong with him. You're not looking at what's right. See, in life, and when we're going through the desert, when we're going through a drought, usually the enemy has us looking at everything that's wrong in the situation when we should be holding on to the one thing that's right, and that's Jesus. Amen? Amen. And if you got Jesus, you got everything. <laughs> I said, God, what do you mean? He said, Craig, I'm going to use your son to reach millions of people. Now, I'm going to be honest, even as a pastor, I have 28 ministers in my family. I come from this long, I mean, we're a, we're a hope-filled church like Hope Restoration at Lakewood. As a matter of fact, I feel at home here, by the way. This is, I feel like I'm preaching at Lakewood right now. And I, 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 I picked up a ball of water and I said, God, my son can't even ask for a drink of water. How's he gonna reach millions of people? And then God spoke to me four words. These are the four words God will speak to you right now, possibly, if you're walking through the desert. But he'll usually speak. You've probably heard these four words whenever you've been, been in the desert, whenever you're just looking for a cool cup of water, when, 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 whenever you're trying to come out of the drought. He just, he just said this. He said, do you trust me? And I didn't give him the pastoral answer. Oh, great God of the universe. I trust you in my time. I didn't, hey, I didn't have it, y'all. I didn't have it. I just said, God, you're all we got. I trust you. And I thought things were going to get better. But guess what? Things got worse. <laughs> Here's the testing time, right? Here's the time where you go, I'm not going to give up. I'm going to keep on going. But during that testing time, God is going to give you key things in your life that's not only going to keep you going, it's going to build you up. It's going to bring you out of the drought and into the abundance of rain. Here's what God did for me. He said, Craig, there's two things I want to give you to bring you out of the drought and into the abundance of rain. He said, first, Craig, he says, I need you to learn to pray bold prayers. Not just get by prayers. Pray bold prayers. He said in Psalm, the Bible says in Psalm 34, 4, it says, I prayed to the Lord and he answered me. Psalm 22, 5 says, they cried to you and were saved. In you they trusted and were not disappointed. Listen, droughts are not the time to complain. Get it off your chest in the beginning, but they are the time to proclaim. Amen? 
to begin to speak declarations over your life, to begin to speak things over your life. See, there's no power in complaining. Complaining is a language of the disempowered. When God was bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt, they were only supposed to go there for 11 days through, through, through to get to the promised land. But because of their murmuring and complaining, it took them 40 years. Some of us wonder why we're still going through it. Are we still complaining? Are we still saying the same things? Are we still on, God, just help me get past this. Just help me get through this. I just want to make it. No, you need to be saying, you will take me through this. You will get me through this situation. I am a victor. I'm not a victim. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's powerful, bold prayers. Then he said a second thing to me. He said, Craig, I want you to learn how to speak the word of God over your life. Speak the word of God. See, the word of God, I, I don't think we fully realize it all the time. Begin to pray over that situation. God begin to say, Craig, I, I want you to pray bold prayers, and I want you to speak my word. And then I heard a story in, the, in Jewish history. And there's a story in Jewish history of a man who dared to pray bold prayers. And he literally became a legend to his people. And his name was Honai, and it was the legend of the circle maker. And what would happen was they hadn't had rain for an entire year. And they had tried everything. Every scribe, every person tried everything. But one day, out came this eccentric sage. You know, he, he's that one that you think is a little crazy, right? That one that does things that most people won't do. But he's not crazy, he's full of the spirit, right? And he takes this staff, this six-foot staff, and he goes in the middle of the town square, and he begins to draw a circle. Not a small circle, but he begins to go 90, 180, 360 degrees, and he draws this large circle, and then he bows down, and he prays three bold prayers for rain. And the first one is this. He said, Lord of the universe, I swear before your great name that I will not move from this circle until you have shown mercy upon your children. And then it happened. For the first time in a year, rain began to fall down. The people looked up, but Honai knew God was bigger than just a little bit of rain. See, some of us need a little bit of rain. Some of us need a flood of God's goodness. And so what Honai did, he prayed a second Bold prayer. He said, not for such rain have I prayed, but for rain that will fill cisterns and pits and caverns. And all of a sudden that sprinkle turned in to a torrential downpour. No raindrop was smaller than an egg. And, 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 and people began to run for cover, but not Honai. See, he knew God was even bigger than that. He knew that they needed rain, not just that day, but for the future. And so he prayed a third, more refined request. And he said, not for such rain have I prayed, but for rain of your favor, of your blessing, of your graciousness. And it began to rain calmly and peacefully. Each raindrop was a tangible token of God's grace, his healing, his love and peace. And I said to myself, man, if God can do it for Honai, can he do it for me? We've been dealing with my son not speaking. We've been dealing with these meltdowns. We've been going through it. I said, if God, if, if I could pray bold prayers and, and if I could speak the word of God like Mama Jody did, then can't God do it for me? So we found 30 healing scriptures in the Bible. And we took those healing scriptures and we began to speak those over Connor every day. And then, then what I did, I didn't have, a, you know, who has, who has a staff in their house? But what I did have is I had a broom, right? I took my broom, and I began to draw a circle. I began to walk around my house. I didn't draw a small circle. I draw a big circle because I serve a big God. I went 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 360 degrees, and I began to pray bold prayers. I began to speak the word of God over my situation. And all of a sudden, when my wife calls me three months later, when we're doing this every day, and let me tell you something, we were walking around our car praying bold prayers. Well, our neighbors thought we were crazy. But sometimes you got to get a little crazy if you want your miracle. Sometimes you got to get a little out of ordinary to see God do that work. 
And we kept on praying our bold prayers. And one night my, my wife calls me, Craig, Craig, get up here. And I run upstairs. I, she's in Karen's room. I think something's a matter. And she, I said, what is it? And she's crying. She said, Craig. She said, I was putting Karen to bed. I was reading a book. And, all, and I prayed. And all of a sudden he began to speak. And he began to say one word after another word. One sentence after another sentence. One paragraph after another paragraph. And you've got to realize I haven't heard my son speak in more than three years. And I said, what do you mean he spoke? And she said, Craig, he spoke. And I said, what did he say? I'll never forget this. She walked me over his bed and she said, Connor, say it for mommy and daddy. Say it again. And this is Connor, right after he did it, what he said. This is my Bible. I am as this I am. I have as this I have. I can do as this I can do. Tonight I will talk the word of God. I'm full of this. My eyes is worried. My heart is accepted. I will never be saved. I'm about to He didn't stop. It's impossible. It is credible. Everybody see. I will wear God. I will never be saved. Never, never, never. I'll never be there. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, somebody. That was awesome. Come on, somebody. Good job, Connor. Give me a high five. He didn't just yeah. speak words. He spoke a spiritual declaration. Woo! Listen, we were... We weren't doing the golf clap, right? We were jumping up and down. He spoke the spiritual declaration. That's what Joel leads with before every message. Little did we know, Connor was taking the messages that I bring home on DVD. We didn't know it. He was taking them upstairs. He put them in his video player. And while he played, it didn't matter if the message changed. That declaration was at the front of every message. And it became his first words. What am I saying to you today? I don't know what you're walking through. I don't know what you're going through. But get your broom out. Get your broom out. Begin to draw your circle. Begin to draw a big, don't draw a small circle. I want you to draw a big circle because we serve a big God. Draw it. Begin to speak bold prayers. Begin to speak the word of God over your situation. Let me tell you, if God can do it for us, can he do it for you today? Come on, somebody. Give the Lord a hand clap. Come on, give the Lord a hand clap. And Pastor Joel spoke about Connor's miracle a few weeks later. And that video went viral around the world. And millions of people heard my son's testimony. So the prophecy in the car that millions of people, and I'll never forget, we were in Chicago White Sox Stadium, 50,000 people doing Night of Hope, and Pastor wanted us to walk out with Connor as his testimony was being played on the big screen. And I'm walked, watching the video, and we're walking out onto the field, and I'm seeing people clapping, crying. And God said... Craig, remember when you were in the car? Remember why I asked you? Trust me. He said, look at all these people. He said, I never go back on my word. I'll never go back on my word. What I tell you will come to pass. Then the second most intimate conversation I had with God was I was walking through our church. See, I didn't know how big God was going to use my son. I didn't know how large it was, but he, he was literally going to Touch special needs, kids, teens, adults, and families around the world. And I stopped by the children's area, and I remember God just stopping me again. He said, Craig, look at what you're doing for typical kids. He said, the children's program looks amazing, but look at what you're doing for special needs kids. And here's the thing. The world, and unfortunately, the church has forgotten about special needs families. They've not included them. They've said, we've said we've been inclusive, but we haven't included them. Yet autism is now the number one developmental disease. In America, 10 years ago, 1 in 110 kids were being diagnosed with autism. Now it's 1 in 34. It's an epidemic, and it's happening all over the world. 
And there are millions of families like mine that would love to come to church, that would love to be a part. They'd love to give and serve and be a part. But if you don't have something for their child, they can't come and be a part. And me and my wife were trying to make it happen. I'll never forget this, man. God said, Craig, these kids deserve the very best just like every other child. He said, when you look in these kids' eyes, he said, who you're looking at is you're looking at me. Because when you do it in the least of these, you do it unto me. And he said, favor will fall you and your church when you begin to reach out to these kids and families. So we pulled together experts, medical experts around research, educators, uh, special needs parents in our team. And we, we worked on for an entire year what would become the Champions Club. And it was ahead of its time. There are developmental centers that you can put in churches, you can put in, in hospitals, you can put in schools. And they have four stations, a physical therapy station to help them with their physical disabilities or ADHD. It also has a sensory station that calms them and helps work with the five senses and, and really helps their brain open up. Then it has an educational station and where you teach them the basics of education and then developing their gifts. And then it has a spirit station. And this is where they learn Bible stories. They memorize. And the kids go in between these four stations in a service time, and they're developed just like every other child. And here's the thing. It's got full training, online training. It's got full we help you with the equipment. We, we have a full curriculum. We have everything to come alongside of any church. And we're seeing amazing results. These kids are not only graduating from different levels of, of education. Some are even going to college. It's, they're getting jobs now. They're serving all throughout Lakewood Church. We have 64 that serve all throughout Lakewood Church. Connor can quote over 60 scriptures. I'm not sure if I can quote over <laughs> Connor could quote over 60 scriptures. He learned that in the Champions Club. And then God began to use that. When we opened up at Lakewood, over 300 families started coming to Lakewood Church just because of the Champions Club. Now, that was in 2009. Now there's some of our greatest families in our church. And these kids, they minister to you even more than you minister to them. And I'm so excited because we're going to launch... The first champion club right here at Hope Restoration Church. We're going to bring them in from the north and the south and the east and the west. We're going to help them become everything God created them to be. You see, because these kids have a destiny. They have a purpose. You know, I didn't know at the time, but if I would have had a typical, typical child, would God be using them like he's using Connor? He's using them to touch the world. But here's the deal, when you minister to them, what they'll do is they'll minister to you.